All right, you ready for the next topic? We're talking about inflammation. So turn with me, please, to Giddens chapter 23. You're going to be completing concept study guide version B for this topic. And these are the objectives we're going to go after today, defining and describing the concept, noticing risk factors, recognizing when an individual has inflammation, and determining what interventions, both nursing interventions and collaborative in interventions, are appropriate. So let's go ahead and start by defining and describing the concept of inflammation. So inflammation is a protective response by the body from some kind of harmful trigger. So it could be an inflammation as a response against tissue injury, infection, or an allergy. Here are some key terms that you'll need to know in terms of inflammation. Acute meaning something that happened suddenly and right now. Chronic means it happened over a long time. So you can have acute inflammation or chronic inflammation. And then some terms that speak about the way fluid shifts during infl inflammation. So exudate is the actual fluid that seeps out from the vascular space into the area that is inflamed. Extravasation is when uh, fluid leaks out like by an IV site. So it's the IV solution leaking out from the vein itself out into the tissue surrounding it. And hyperemia is the excess of blood in the vessels specific that are supplying um, an organ or another part of the body, or in this case, in, in the type, the area where the area is inflamed. So an, an excess of blood being supplied to the area that is inflamed. Now, the scope of this concept ranges from no inflammation to active inflammation, and the inflammation itself can be localized to a specific area of the body or systemic, meaning generalized uh, inflammation throughout the body. And active inflammation can be acute, meaning happening suddenly and short term, or long term, meaning chronic. And inflammation can also be used to repair or restore. So if your kid is running outside on the sidewalk and they stop and they skid, they fall and they skid their knee, the area around that um, abrasion is going to look red and um, puffy, but that's all of the body's healing response to that localized tissue injury. So what's the process with inflammation? Well, when the body recognizes an area of infection, injury, or trauma, it knows that it needs all the good guys come into the scene to help rescue and fix the body up. And so how do we do that? Well, we get more fluid to that area because the fluid is going to bring more oxygen. It's going to bring more WBCs that can help fight whatever infection is there. And all of that is going to stimulate tissue growth. And, and improving the area. And so by increasing the inflammation, increasing capillary permeability so that more fluid leaks out of the vascular space into the tissue where it's needed, and it, the, the, the fighters, the WBCs and all the oxygen kind of hang out in that area a little longer, um, it's going to help improve the, the healing of that area. So it really is about getting all the right players in the body to the scene of the crime to help fix things up and allow them to get there quickly, spread out a little bit more and linger there a little longer to help heal the body. And really the function of the inflammatory response is to restore the normal functioning of cells after injury. And sometimes cells just can't be repaired. And so then the second goal is then to kind of create fibrous tissue like scar tissue um, to form some kind of secondary response or um, second best uh, fix to some kind of injury. So the goal is normal repaired of normal cells. Scar tissue is kind of the backup goal if that can't be accomplished. So here are the steps that happen in an acute inflammatory response. The tissue is, in, is injured and then there's this immediate release of chemical mediators to call everybody to the table and get everybody there to come and help fix the area. And so that those chemical mediators cause vasodilation, the blood vessels themselves get bigger to have increased blood flow. 
all of that increased blood flow causes capillary permeability. So those big dilated vessels also get more leaky. And so blood can flow more freely out of those vessels into the tissue and hang out there. But when all that blood flow is hanging out in the tissue, you're gonna see swelling of that area from the extra blood flow there. And finally, the, the body is gonna kind of wall off the area of, of tissue damage. And so that that stays in a very specific part of the body and doesn't cause systemic problems elsewhere. So we get more blood flow, leaky blood vessels so that more of the uh, blood stays in the tissue. The tissue is going to see an increase in temperature and an increase in size due to all that fluid hanging out. Um, and then all of those uh, different restorative cells like WBCs can start doing their job of tissue repair. So we get all the good guys at the, at the site, all those killer T cells and um, all those memory B cells if, if it's an infection kind of response to memorize the response for the future. Exudate forms, we get kind of this pus that can form um, from this inflammatory response. We get extra glucose and oxygen to the site because we need those components for wound healing. And then we activate those endothelial cells. And so what happens is actually endothelial cells are kind of close together, but during an acute inflammatory response, they open up to allow that tissue, all that fluid and the extra blood and all those mediators to start free, freely flow, flowing through the tissue. So those endothelial cells open up and allow movement through them. Now this is all very well and good and our body does a great job at managing inflammatory responses until it doesn't. And there are consequences of an excessive or ineffective inflammatory response. For a localized response, the tissue itself can be damaged from compression. If there's no area for it to swell to, that can be a problem. Um, there's the possibility of development of a chronic inflammation and, and all of those effects on the local body on a local part of tissue are great for an acute response, but you get chronic inflammation of your body, chronic leaking of the blood vessels and chronic um, stress on your body. It can lead to some problems such as arthrosclerosis, plaques in the arteries chronic renal disease, kidney problems, and neurological problems because our brains really need good uh, perfusion and oxygenation in order to thrive. So let's talk about the risk factors for inflammation. Now, in terms of populations um, at greatest risk, it's the same as it is for many, the very young and the very old and also the uninsured. And the reason for that being is they don't always seek medical care as soon as they need it because they're afraid of the cost that it's going to take. And so by the time they do seek medical care, it's almost too late for them. And especially as in terms of chronic inflammation and things like uh, end stage kidney disease and heart attacks and strokes, these are the end points of chronic inflammation that has gone unchecked. So let's talk about what would you notice when an individual has inflammation? Well, there's a really nice table on Giddens 23.2 about the clinical manifestations of inflammation. It's on Davis page 224. Let's go ahead and pause here and let's go through that together. So let's take a look together at table 23.2 on page 224 of Giddens. Um, it talks about local manifestations when you're having a localized inflammatory response, things like localized swelling and pain, and it'll feel hot to the touch. You'll notice redness, and you may notice some exudate. Serous exudate is going to be that clear uh, fluid. Fibrinous exudate is going to be kind of a cloudy one, and it's because there's a lot of like protein, extra protein in it. Purulent uh, exudate is like pussy exudate. And hemorrhagic means bloody, bloody exudate. And so all four types are different kinds of discharge you can notice from localized inflammation. Now, systemic manifestations means when your body has is, is inflammation throughout the body, and you're going to see things like a fever. 
So when we have an infection and we have a, a systemic infection, that's why we get a fever. It's part of the inflammatory response. Leukocytosis, an increase in white blood cells and increase in plasma protein. So proteins and white blood cells saying, I don't know where I'm supposed to go, but I know I need to fix something somewhere. So I'm just gonna go everywhere and figure out where I can help repair and do my job. Malaise and fatigue, that feeling of just un being unwell and being tired because this inflammatory response takes a lot out of your body and it takes time and rest to be able to heal. Now, diagnostic testing are going to try to look for the underlying cause of the inflammation. So it could be things like a CBC, a complete blood count, or a WBC um, to really get that white blood cell count as part of the CBC with differential. So what kinds of white blood cells are showing up to the party? A C-reactive protein and an ESR are nonspecific um, markers of increased elevation of inflammation in the body, just increased inflammation. We don't know exactly where, but we know that it's inflamed. Um, you can look for radiographic studies like MRIs or CAT scans or PET scans or colonoscopies. And again, we're looking for those underlying causes of the inflammation. Now it's time to talk about some nursing and collaborative interventions to uh, really eliminate inflammation. In terms of prevention, we're really talking about how do we prevent from injury and infection, which are two main causes for inflammation in the first place. So things like proper food storage and cooking, um, safe, using safety equipment to prevent injury, maintaining good hand hygiene and good hygiene in general, really reducing the risk for injury and infection will then reduce the risk for inflammation if you don't have an injury or an infection to become inflamed. Well, here's one thing you don't have to memorize for this chapter. There are really no secondary prevention measures for um, inflammation specifically as it pertains to the general population. But there certainly are some things that we can do as collaborative interventions when inflammation is, a, is a, uh, apparent. This first one, if you're an athlete, I'm sure you are familiar with it, it's RICE. So it's this acronym, we love our acronyms rest, ice, compression, elevation. So anything from like a localized um, small injury, a sprain or a trauma, um, by doing rest and ice and compression and elevation, it's gonna minimize the swelling to that area and minimize the pain. And because this inflammatory response kind of happens immediately after an injury, it's most beneficial in those first day or two after the injury happened. Now there are a number of different pharmacologic agents we can talk about when it comes to inflammation. First and foremost, steroids, um, for example, prednisone, or, uh, are really going to help suppress that immune, immune system response and you'll see decreased inflammation and swelling. Now NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory um, drugs, it, the title of it itself literally tells you what it, it does. It's not a steroid, but it's an anti-inflammatory medication, um, like things like ibuprofen and naproxen. So the good thing about NSAIDs, we talked about this in our pain lecture, NSAIDs like ibuprofen not only are going to reduce inflammation, but they're going to reduce pain and they're fever reducers. So they can work for one or all three of those reasons. You can use different um, monoclonal antibodies, antipyretics, things like acetaminophen, analgesics, things that are going to relieve pain that caused by the inflammation, inflammation causes pain. And then of course, antimicrobials like antibiotics are going to treat the disease causing the inflammation. So if, you, if the inflammation is due to a bacterial infection, then an antibiotic is gonna treat that underlying infection. When you treat the infection, then the inflammation goes away as well. Here are your interrelated concepts for the concept of inflammation, things like immunity, because the, it is immune response. An infection is going to cause inflammation. So that's the link there. Uh, tissue integrity is going to be, uh, when, when there are compromises in tissue integrity, you're going to see localized inflammation. Thermoregulation, when you have inflammation, the body temperature goes up. Um, gas exchange, there is uh, an increase in oxygen demand in areas of inflammation. 
inflammation is very tiring for the body and taxing and your patient is going to experience fatigue and stress can cause a chronic increase in inflammation because the body with chronic stress, the body perceives that the, that the patient is under constant attack and raises up the inflammatory response constantly, which is not a healthy way to live. And in terms of featured exemplars, cellulitis is the one we're going to focus on this week, especially how it overlaps with infection and tissue integrity and inflammation. But if you'll notice on here, we've already talked about asthma when we talked um, in 107. And so think about as well, the effect of inflammation as it relates to asthma. And that's everything you'll need pre-lecture on the concept of inflammation. We'll see you in class.